Hi, my name is Mary McCool Berry. I am the podcast host of Reading Swizzle. I am so excited to have you with me today as we consider ideas that agitate the status quo in education. I believe these are ideas worth considering. We are hearing a lot about the science of reading. There are workshops and seminars and symposiums and more and more products to buy. But parents, educators, and taxpayers all need clarification. I decided that we have to consider our history and we have to take a look back at the root of the problem. So today, this episode and many to follow is an episode that's wrapped around a book. The author's ideas are indeed worth considering and acting upon. Why? The book is bold. The book shows that shared knowledge really does matter. The book shows that we have to build background knowledge in every student in order to make our education system equitable for all and for our students to exit knowing something, knowing some type of content. The author of this book believes that we need a common intellectual currency. I want you to consider background, background knowledge. What is a movie without the background music building before a scary episode, a scary scene? Think of a musical composition with all the different background elements added in. What would our life story be without all of the background knowledge? People get to know us by learning our background. When we go to a doctor, the doctor takes a background medical history and a family history. When we do anything, like planting a tree, we have to know the background of the soil composition. We have to know a, a lot about the environment in order for the plant or the tree to survive and thrive. In my opinion, background information informs everything in life. So why then are we leaving background knowledge out of our school places? The phrases in this author's book seized my attention. These are the phrases. One, shared knowledge. Number two, educate a citizen and unify. The book that I'd like to present to you today is How to Educate a C Citizen, The Power of Shared Knowledge to Unify a Nation. It is written by acclaimed author and researcher, Dr. E. D. Hirsch, Jr. Why did I choose Dr. Hirsch's book and ideas? Well, he discusses the need for commonality and what our students learn in American schools. And Edie Hirsch believes that shared knowledge will tilt the balance in favor of equality, democracy, and academic achievement. Hirsch created believe, believe so strongly in a common intellectual currency that he started a nonprofit organization called the Core Knowledge Foundation. And this is what he says, I quote, only a well-rounded knowledge specific curriculum can impart needed knowledge to all children and overcome inequality and opportunity. His nonprofit, the Core Knowledge Foundation, makes available free curricular materials that can be downloaded by teachers, educators, schools, parents. And this is a very important part um, of his belief system. From the foundation, 
which he created. Children can only advance, advance educationally when they have the expected prior knowledge. That makes total sense. In reading, we don't understand unless we have background or prior knowledge. They can become better readers, Hirsch argues, only by building extensive knowledge of the world. He goes on to, in his foundation to also say, those students then can become effective members of a wider society by sharing the knowledge taken for granted by literate writers and speakers in that society. Social justice demands that all children have access to shared knowledge. And he said only by specifying that knowledge can all children, we can guarantee equal access to all children. Dr. Hirsch is really an interesting guy because I believe his, when he began his work uh, in, in research, he's a professor emeritus at the University of Virginia, and he started this work in the 1980s. He was the first to write that as a whole, there is a knowledge gap, a communication gap, and an allegiance gap in the United States. We don't understand each other, we don't trust each other, and we don't like each other. Why is this? He believes that if we don't have a common base, we cannot communicate with each other because we don't have enough knowledge in common. So Hirsch opens his exceptional book, How to Educate a Citizen, The Power of Shared Knowledge to Unify a Nation. He begins by introducing us to three people in the first chapter. I would like you to imagine that we are in a play and I am introducing you. So imagine the theater curtains closing and imagine the characters about whom I'm going to share. The first man of the hour is, this great American stated that shared knowledge and values learned in school are just as crucial to our nation's success as its constitution and its formal laws. Again, shared knowledge is as important as our constitution and our formal laws. Who is this first man of the hour? His name is Noah Webster. Noah Webster was born in 1758 and died in 1843. He was the United States chief and earliest schoolmaster. He also served as an advisor to George Washington. Webster is really famous for his dictionary of the English language, the Webster Dictionary, and his speller, which many of us today are not very familiar with. Some believe that Noah Webster's dictionary helped form our democracy. He also wrote a speller, and this speller was believed to have created this equal shared knowledge in the earliest schools, and it was a predecessor, it preceded the McGuffey readers. And I found this so fascinating. Noah Webster's spelling book at the time totaled the largest sale of any book except the American Bible at the time. He wanted, he was the first person who wanted universal education for everyone. And he knew that our new democracy, our people could only survive if members agreed to its universal founding principles, obeyed its laws, and spoke the same language. And did he succeed? Well, according to Hirsch, he did. Because by the 19th century, 
Only one nation in the world, the US, had a fully standardized, universally intelligible oral and print language. Our first man of the hour, Noah Webster. Get ready now for scene two. I'll close the curtain and let's hear a little music. The curtain opens. Our next man of the hour is Thomas Jefferson, American founding father and the principal author of the Declaration of Independence. He was also the third president of the United States of America. And Jefferson agreed that we needed in the US an all-inclusive school system. He didn't want education only to be available to the rich. But alas, in 1778, his ideas were deemed too radical. So he doesn't really get off the ground. Until the 19th century, and this is when Hirsch introduces us to the third man of the hour, and his name is Horace Mann. You might be wondering who he is. You might have heard his name, but let's take a look at who Horace Mann is or was and why his ideas still continue today. Horace Mann was the founder of American education. He was the significant force between a unified school system. And guess what? Horace Mann and some other leaders came up with something called the common school. It was really embraced in the Northeastern states and in the Midwest. And what they wanted to do was to bring cohesion for all ranks of society. They didn't specify grade by grade topics, but it turned out that way anyway. Why? McGuffey's readers, William McGuffey wrote readers. These reading books took over Webster's spellers. And the McGuffey readers were taught in grade levels that indicated their titles. Therefore, the books taught students knowledge and the language was sophisticated enough that it improved the reader and the student's own language skills. So the common school unified educators and school book writers through the first half of the 20, 20th century. What were the effects? Well, in the first half of the 20th century, our students and adults were rated at the top or near the top in their ability to read and communicate. But something changes. By 1950, with the retirement of older teachers and textbooks, a new educational theory took root. The focus was on the child rather than the nation. And this new movement after 1950 gave way to child-centered schools. Educators believed that the child's natural development should be aligned with the child's interest and the child's nature. But Hirsch calls this educational romanticism. What happened next was this movement, the progressivism movement in American teacher education. Language instruction was no longer based on common subject matter. It was taught, that what was taught were topics that addressed each child's strengths and weaknesses and interests. So what happened? By the 1960s, the effects really began to show with declining verbal scores of middle and high school students. Hirsch writes quite beautifully, Language mastery depends not on diversity, but on the commonality of knowledge. This progressive education stress, uh, uh, stressed project-based learning. And I will get back to that at another time because I have done a lot of project-based learning in my classroom. Child-centered learning became the new phrase, but unfortunately, 
1983, something else happened. It is now 1983, the president is President Ronald Reagan, and he re re releases a report titled, A Nation at Risk, the Imperative for Educational Reform. A statement in the report reads this, if an unfriendly power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might have well viewed it as an act of war. Yet, most Americans, we don't give thought to the mediocrity of the school curriculum. In 2015, the United States ranked 24th in the world on the terms of its reading ability. This is according to the PISA scores, the Program of International Student Assessment. I love this quote. A nation's reading scores are highly predictive, not only of its competitors, but also of its cohesion. Think about our current state in America. Think about our reading rate, our competitors, and think about the disunity. So we do not have cohesion. In the report summoned by Doc, uh, President Ronald Reagan, it also states, for they indicate whether communication among adults in a country is effective and widespread. The lower reading scores reflect a social, economic, and political competence decline, we need to make a comeback. Hirsch goes on to say that social disadvantage is not educational fate. We know exactly what it is to teach reading. We know what they ha students have to do to develop into a reader. They must share background knowledge with the author of the book, the article, or the text that they are reading. And Hirsch contends that if the nation starts sharing more background knowledge, their reading scores will improve. So will the verbal communication beyond the written word. Here's some scientific insight that Edie Hirsch peppers the first chapter. The individual child has no natural inborn developmental blueprint to be developed. A child develops according to its surrounding culture. Shared language is the most crucial component. I did a little digging after I read the first chapter of this book. Why is there no national curriculum in the United States? Well, education has always been a function of each of our 50 states. Under the current law, it is not legal for the United States Department of Education to supervise or direct any curriculum. So then I decided to ask the question, well, are there any countries in the world with a national curriculum? And I found there are several, France, Hungary, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Korea, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Portugal, Spain, and the United Kingdom. Why in the world don't we have a common curriculum? And I'm not talking about common core standards because the common core really did very little to advance uh, students' knowledge. It did little to advance student achievement in our country because it was so loosey-goosey. There were so many ways to interpret this common store, uh, common uh, standards, common core standards. Commonality, even though we are all here together in the United States of America, it has been resisted, this commonality. People who feel left out of the dominant culture, 
Those opposed think, oh, it's going to be bland. It's going to be boring. It will be unproductive. Catholic leaders really feared that the typical school was, the common school was dominantly Protestant. Others thought uniformity killed creativity, imagination, and ingenuity. However, Hirsch really shows that this common knowledge movement, knowledge matters, shakes up how students learn, what they learn, what they're able to achieve. And E.D. Hirsch has done this because he has opened schools across our country. They're called core knowledge schools. And they are really worth thinking about emulating. We need to take a closer look. So this is the first chapter in How to Educate a Citizen, The Power of Shared Knowledge to Unify a Nation by Edie Hirsch. I will continue the future podcasts for the next six weeks on this book because I believe we need to dive deeply. And if kids go to school and they want to, they, they're learning something like the American Revolutionary War, or they're learning about um, Egypt, they're going to want to come to school. Currently, we're giving kids worksheets and it's skill-based. They have to find the main idea or they have to read little books. Kids in America are not learning topics on a deep level. And so one of my LinkedIn posts, I put a Saturday Night Live skit on the post. Saturday Night Live and many other comedians will go onto the streets of America and ask questions that they believe every American should know. And we don't. Way to rectify this problem, this massive problem, is to look back to Noah Webster. It's to look back to Thomas Jefferson. And it's to look back at Horace Mann and the common school movement. We need to have more things in common because when one school system or state diversifies its curriculum and the other does not, how will we ever come together? How will we ever understand each other? And how will our democracy survive? So sip your swizzle and read chapter two if you wish. If you don't have time, I'll be back in the next episode with more information worth considering. In the second chapter, incoherence and unshared knowledge, critical thinking about mm, really nothing in particular, child-centered civics, and he will also contrast child-centered and knowledge-centered schools. So I thank you very, very much for joining me on this very first podcast for the Reading Swizzle. And I hope you come back. I'm Mary McCool Berry, and I'm signing off. Thank you.